Uh, thank you so much. Welcome, Michael, to this series on mental health conversations. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, it's great to be here. <laughs> and um, would just love to start. We can both introduce yourself if you could say your name, if you like your preferred pronouns. And if you, if you would, what you do for the college, how long you've been here as well, would be great. Sure, sure. Michael Woodruff, he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm the director of the Bowdoin Outing Club, which uh, I've long maintained is probably the best job uh, in the state of Maine, certainly, and possibly in the outdoor industry anywhere. But, uh, I, you know, and the best part of that is getting to interact and work with our students and especially, uh, you know, being out in the field with them and working with our student leaders and getting to meet new students. It's amazing, positive work, which is what's been so challenging about not having students on campus during the pandemic. Um, I've been here for, this is, I'm in my 29th year at the college, actually in February, I'll have finished my 29th year, yeah. I can't do the quick math. When was the start here? February of 92, I came back, yeah. <laughs> it was a while ago. <laughs> Yeah, I, gradu I graduated in 87 and I spent five years away and then came back, so. Okay. Nice. So I'm Roland Mendiola. I use he, him, his pronouns. I serve as the interim director of counseling and wellness and I'm a clinical psychologist. And um, a couple months back, we started the series, Ginny, uh, Ginny Porsche and I, um, really with the inspiration to um, have voices heard that you just might not, or at least in a at a more personal level. When it comes to mental health, um, maybe something that we still don't talk the most openly about in general, but particularly when it comes to people's experience of who they are and where they come from and how that informs their experience of mental health in different ways. So um, thank you for doing this again. You're welcome. I, uh, I look forward to this conversation. So starting out like we do, um, did you grow up, Michael? Um, talking about mental or emotional health? And if so, how? And if not, yeah. why not? No, uh, I would say not. And I think, uh, you know, interestingly enough, because I think when I was young, when I was probably uh, 10 or so, actually maybe 12 or 13, um, you know, my dad became unemployed and um, it was really hard, uh, you know, that my mother was kind of supporting the family and my dad, I think my dad was really struggling with, uh, with, uh, depression, uh, you know, started then and, um, you know, but we didn't really talk about that, which is, you know, in retrospect is really fascinating to kind of reflect upon mm. what was going on there. Cause it definitely, um, delayed my understanding of, you know, mental health and mental health issues and um, things that I've had to struggle with. How do you generally make sense of, um, and I know people have tons of uh, very understandable reasons. How did you make sense of why those conversations weren't being had? Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, growing up in the seventies, um, weirdly there was a lot of stuff that we just didn't talk about, right? And growing up in a very, very white, middle-class setting, right? Surround in very white community, um, you know, New England. Um, yeah, there were just a ton of things that never were talked about, right? I mean, I, you know, as soon as I got to Bowdoin as an 18 year old, I realized that I was completely homophobic, right? And, but I had no idea of that in high school, right? And growing up, I, no idea. And I'm, and, you know, until I met people from other parts of the country and, uh, you know, from more urban areas who were like, what are you talking about, right? I just, it was totally, I was total, completely unaware of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the same thing with the mental health issues, right? We, you're, if you don't grow up in a um, household or community where you get to discuss that stuff, it's just off your radar, right? Until you have a real impactful experience or yeah. become more educated about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe there are some obvious um, things here in a way, but but still, I think worth worth saying out loud. Um, why was that? Why was that such a case? Probably uh, beyond the seventies, but well beyond the seventies. But yeah, during that time, why weren't we talking about so many th different things? Right. 
well, you know, I think the country had just gone through, you know, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, you know, the Nixon Watergate stuff. And we were definitely, <laughs> my take on the, my childhood, the 70s and the 80s is we we're in this little la-la land. If you were in, you know, this sort of middle-class white existence where you didn't have to worry about too much stuff, right? Even though there was all sorts of crazy stuff happening, you know, as we're talking about, uh, whether it's mental health or anything else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was, we were kind of, we kind of went back into the leave it to beaver sort of model where it was just the little model family. And, you know, there were, I know I, we had neighbors who were crazy alcoholic parents, right? But we didn't even talk about that, even though we would see this crazy stuff going on, I can remember, but my parents never really mentioned any of it, you know? And so, yeah, very for, confusing for kids when you saw that, or you were just yeah. totally oblivious, right? Yeah. You know, those are the two things. It was, it was kind of, it's kind of wild to reflect on that. I agree. I agree. Um, um, I was mostly a kid of the eighties, but very similar situation. I feel like, like things where we were and everyone surrounding us were like well off enough to, yeah. to be sort of protected by, um, from a lot of, um, uh, a lot of difficulties. And, um, and so, it really felt like a bubble and I, everything felt relatively fine. All yeah. The time. yeah I it, also, yeah. well, I was going to say, I also wonder if there was, there's some fear in that, you know, for our parents, like, okay, we don't want to touch that because something might happen to us. Right. Or we might have to examine, you know, our kind of interaction with whatever that topic is. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's like, you know, kind of willfully oblivious in some ways even if subconsciously, right? So I'd love to then hear about how you, um, how you might describe your relationship to, and, and I define very broadly, you know, mental health, like it could be just like emotional life, it could be yep. relationships, it could be, you know, yep. it relates to quite a lot. So um, how you relate to it now, and then of course, like also very curious about what your journey has been from, you know, more or less like 10 years old. To, yeah, yeah. I don't know, when it comes well, to so just as a kind of general concept, um, you know, we had, we saw some uh, senior survey results a couple years ago in which, uh, you know, a big percentage, over 50% of the uh, students mm. put not applicable when they came to the Center for Spiritual and Religious Life, right? I was like, all right, I, I found that <laughs> incredibly, you know, ironic in that to be human is to be spiritual, right? And yet we're totally out of touch with that, or at least half of us, or maybe more, right? And when you look at our current culture and society, it's clear yeah. that there are many of us who are struggling spiritually. And I think mental health and spirituality kind of go hand in hand, right? And so I would sort of posit that we're also a huge percentage of us, if not most of us are, have struggles with mental health, you know, many times not even aware. And I think that was for me from, you know, my childhood until really my mid forties, I think I was in that kind of category of not really being aware that so much of many of the things that I struggled with and, you know, behaviors that were not, um, positive or constructive for me, you know, whether that was in my relationships or my, my physical health and wellness, right. Uh, were really tied into a lot of, um, my sort of mental health and wellness and, you know, uh, trying to understand, uh, sort of what drove, you know, a lot of that behavior. And so, um, although it took some really sort of uh, dark periods, right. To, to yeah. kind of, um, really illuminate for me. Uh, I think people around me, um, you know, especially family and close friends, um, you know, after I, you know, was figured some of this stuff out, you know, would be like, Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> right. But for me, it really was, uh, you know, it was incredibly helpful actually to understand, um, you know, that depression was something that I had been struggling with for 30 plus years, right? And, uh, 
you know, 10 years later, I am in a really much better place, even though it's not as if, uh, you know, it just goes away, right? It's not as if mental health is cured. Right. It's that we have to learn to understand, you know, how it impacts us in all facets of our lives, right? And, uh, you know, there's, you know, obviously there's all sorts, there's a range of uh, approaches to how you want to deal with that or how you need to deal with it. But um, just having the awareness and understanding, um, you know, and, the, you know, thinking, I, I think with this pandemic, we've seen that, you know, most of us have some kind of a struggle, you know, with our with our mental health and perspective uh, on lives, our lives. And, you know, if you look at the way we live in our modern society, I think, uh, you know, you can point out kind of crazy behaviors that we sort of engage in and mass, right? Mm -hmm. With our, you know, iPhones being a perfect little example, right? Like, that's like a field day, I imagine, for people in your field of... <laughs> study right like whoa what is this thing that you cannot put down or yeah. leave at home for a weekend right? quite a lot the yeah. struggle with controlling one's screen time yeah all, all kinds of different screen time yeah. but it's such a great point michael and and like definitely makes me reflect on my own trajectory and and just even the piece about um that these things aren't um linear and straightforward and formulaic in some kind of way. They're very cyclical and um, uh, all over, really all over the place, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if we're lucky and fortunate, um, I think there is some kind of, maybe hopefully some steady progression, but it's still, there's a lot of, in my experience back and forth, and I'm someone who's also long struggled with, with depression since a young age. and. Um, it was, it was a real, uh, I don't know, but I, I think part of what you're saying, I mean, coming to terms with it was a, was a big deal. Yeah. No, I, for me, there was some relief in it, right? Because, uh, you know, when you do the same thing over and over again, and you get the same negative results, then you start wondering, like, what is wrong with me, right? <laughs> like, well, you know, uh, you know, unless you start trying to blame it all on external factors, right? But as soon as you become somewhat right. introspective, right? right? And uh, start thinking, okay, what is it that I'm doing wrong? Or why right. am I doing, you know, several things wrong? You know, why am I, you know, ending up here? Um, yeah, then f to f have someone else kind of tell me, okay, well, have you thought about this, right? This could be, or this is, like you are suffering from depression, right? Yeah. And that's something that you need to address if you want to change things. That's, for me, that was hugely, um, it was really a relief, right? To actually say, okay, there's something going on with my brain chemistry that is beyond my control. Like I am not able to fix this without some help, right? And we talk about that quite a lot. Uh, it's a point of focus for sure with students of just starting to, to name it, to acknowledge it, to, to honor it in some way and, and acknowledge also the fact that like, I, I need something else than what I've been doing, mm -hmm. whether that's help or support or, or, or something. Mm -hmm. um, if you would, and, and again, like I said, Michael, whatever you feel comfortable sharing is exactly what we need for this. And, um, and just trusting that. Um, are there any examples that come to mind around how you're describing going from like more of a lack of awareness in your life around different aspects of it mm -hmm. to, to coming to more awareness, like an example of how that, how and why that happened for you? Yeah, sure. Well, I think the biggest piece for me, um, the, the biggest symptom of depression that uh, just runs through as a continuous thread literally for 40 plus years was um, anger, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a pretty typical sort of male depression yeah. symptom. And, um, you know, and pretty severe in different phases of my life, right? So when I was young and I was an athlete and I was incredibly competitive, mm -hmm. I was like so far off on the competitive, you know, spectrum and not always constructively, right? I was the kid who just like was would get, so angry you know i can remember being angry in uh you know like eight-year-old youth hockey because 
we were losing a game and the coach wouldn't put me back out there because I want to go out there and, uh, you know, win this game. Right. And I'm sitting on the bench crying, not in sadness, but in rage. Right. Because, uh, I couldn't do this. Right. So, and then that just kept going, um, throughout my adult life, you know, in, in relationships and, um, uh, you know, if you have a relationship and not just, you know, my wife or girlfriends, but just people around me and my, you know, my kids, my, you know, certainly my siblings when I was young and, you know, having, trying to have a relationship with someone who gets really angry mm. uh, and irrationally so, right, uh, is not an easy thing. And so um, that in particular, when I was told, look, you have, you have depression and one of, you know, this is one of the symptoms and, and the, the scenario in which I figured out that I had depression was really because I'd actually gotten to a very dark place in terms of uh, personally, you know, in terms of not wanting to get out of bed in the morning, not having motivation to do anything, right. Not really caring, not taking care of myself, just really being, um, yeah, just in a, in a dark, dark place. And so, um, it really wasn't about the anger issue, but once I right. um, learned that, oh, this is actually depression that is, you know, impacting you this way and learn more about it. And I saw that, you know, that anger and male depression were kind of a, you know, a very closely related. I was like, oh, well, that makes so much sense. And it actually just allowed me to reflect back on literally, you know, 30 plus years of my life and, and sort of put that in context. I'm, I'm so glad you're bringing that up because it's um, I mean it's a not so subtle point, but but um, and I can go on my own kind of rant about this, but but um, anger is technically not as part of the clinical definition of depression, so it it does I think get um, uh, get get missed in some ways. At least even you know general population might not think of it that way. You might see like irritability or something yeah. like but you sure. won't see that word anger like mm -hmm. in which is which is funny even yeah. though most clinicians will practice from a place of looking for that yep well the irritability piece right is the crux of that because that was the that's what tipped me off to how irrational this was it was the things in my home life whether my wife or my kids things that would happen things that i would get irritated at them for that made absolutely no sense to get upset about, right? I can and, 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 in, and yet in my mind, I was completely justified in being irritated. And right. it's the degree to which that irritation, you know, cranks up to the anger, right? And how you express that, irri that irritation and, you know, being critical of people. And so, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, to, for I, me- Especially that, that maybe the, the combination of the irritation and the personal justification, I think it's yeah. particularly um, dangerous. Right. Well, just not having the awareness that this is, yeah, I mean, I, in my mind, I was completely justified in, in yeah. feeling that way and uh, really could not see until I adjusted my perspective, just couldn't right. see that. Right. right. You know? So you're already speaking to it, Michael, um, particularly at least in. Um, the, the sort of gendered aspects, being a male within this experience. Um, anything else you would say about things like who you are and where you come from that inform not only <clears throat> experiences like anger and depression, but also now how you, how you deal with them? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, for me, um, growing up and um, definitely, I, you know, I refer to it as old school, right? The Kind of that old school male, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not expressing emotions, having to be strong, right? Uh, I have a hard time crying, and yeah, me too. When I really want to cry, you know, you know, you know, yeah. uh, you go home or you're sitting in your office and you've just had a really tough day right. or week, and <laughs> you just you know you you want to cry, like it's right. literally that moment where you're like, I just want to cry, <laughs> and I can't cry. You even have that thought, like I yeah. Wish no, I do. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. wow, I can't even cry. I really want to cry. Yeah. Like that's what I need is that emotional release and I can't do it. Right. And so, and it's because it was programmed in, right. We weren't, you're not supposed to cry. I mean, being told 
I'm being told, you know, big boys don't cry, you know, right. men don't cry, right. you know, suck it up. Um, and that's, you know, it was certainly part of that uh, athletic culture growing up, but even in the, you know, within the context of, you know, friend groups and, um, you know, everything you see on television or in the movies, you know, it's just wildly reinforced. And so having, you know, just having that awareness, you know, that's been the last, you know, say 10 years that I've developed that awareness of, I really want to cry right now, but I can't, you know? And so, um, I'm going to yeah. ask you a really, uh, therapisty question. <laughs> yeah. It's not as deep as it sounds like, but I'm making <laughs> it, but, um, what is it like when you even just say that out loud? Like oh. acknowledging that the, this was our programming. Yeah. And well, the see, words, yeah, the words you're using exactly like. Right. So for me, it's been, um, it's been great. Now it's great. Like I have, <laughs> right, right, like, right. I, it's very much like I said, the, you know, being diagnosed with depression for me was really liberating. Right. And I've kind of embraced that. Um, you know, and I brace it around all of our work, you know, all of our DEI work, right? I'm like, yeah, I grew up in this incredibly white racist, you know, as I mentioned, homophobic, sexist uh, environment. And so there was a video I saw of folks talking about this, probably like, I got to find this video, it was probably five or so years ago. And this uh, priest came on and he was like, you know, I'm a recovering homophobe. And I was like, yeah, that's how I think about myself. <laughs> you know, I'm a recovering homophobe, you know, a recovering racist, or, you know, everything. And, um, you know, I grew up in this culture of toxic masculinity. Um, and it's, uh, I find it, I, I find it, I really find it um, liberating to be able to talk about it, Roland. I think that um, it's still a challenge for us, right? I think that I know a lot of men you know, between the ages of 30 and 60, say, or, you know, whenever, uh, it's a real struggle, right? Because the problem, and this is what I think for me, I don't know how this happened, um, but somehow um, it doesn't, uh, I don't take personally this concept that I am part of, you know, all these systems that have created all of these issues, social issues, right? I'm, I'm in it, I'm part of it and, and I'm complicit in it all, but I can be an individual and I can work on doing better and I can hopefully work on, um, you know, contributing to a better whole in our culture and communities, but I don't have to, um, you know, struggle with guilt or, you know, feeling like, you know, I'm yeah. bad because of all this. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah, I, I can acknowledge it. And that's, I think that's powerful, right? To be able to do that as far yeah. as feeling like I have some agency and all this stuff. Right. Not having to carry those parts anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the male thing, crazy. Think, you know, thinking about it. Holy cow. There Growing is up. some contrast for sure that I experience. And, and maybe you do as well with, with um, these, uh, these students, these young men, particularly maybe that um, where they're, wow, they're just so willing to talk about their feelings and their opinions and, you know, their experiences in a, in a sensitive way. And I still feel like it's within certain um, <laughs> enclosed spaces <laughs> with certain individuals. Like it's clear that maybe those conversations aren't having, being had with their friends or peers. Or... Yeah, and I wonder, <laughs> Roland, how much of that has to do with, um you know, the masculinity piece and how much of it is actually, I f fear actually that, you know, over the course of the last 10 years or so with smartphones and social media, like the whole cancel culture is really, I think, having a chilling effect on people's ability to express what they're thinking. You know, you know me, I say a lot of things that just come straight out of my brain without being filtered, but yeah. um, it's really hard sometimes to have substantive conversations about a lot of these topics, whether it's mental health or racism or, you know, gender, sexuality, anything, because people are afraid to say the wrong thing. Yeah. And if they are perceived to have said something that's sexist or racist uh, or homophobic, whatever it is, that they're going to just get jumped on. Mm -hmm. And so they're the safe option is just not to share, right. Not yep. to say anything or not to ask questions. Yeah. Right. I still feel like, and this is another part of kind of 
you know, the learning curve, I feel like I'm still learning, right? Like my trajectory is still really steep in terms of all the things I have to learn, whether it's about mental health or racism or any of these issues. And so, yeah, but you have to have the ability to actually ask questions and talk about that or have at least some friends you can trust yeah. that you can talk to because otherwise you're just stuck in the same cycle, right? We, we desperately need to get past that. Yeah. Part of things Cause that's been the case. That's classic for right. particularly racial cultural work for decades now. Yeah. Like that's the same pattern we've seen. And right. uh, I think you're right. I think it still persists. Um, it's interesting, not to say that we do it any sort of better or altogether different, but <clears throat> in circles in the mental health field, there's very much the, you know, the, the working view that, that our thoughts are, are our thoughts. Like, but they're not necessarily real and substantial and valid and true, mm -hmm. um, that they're very reactionary uh, and conditioned over <laughs> countless years. Right. most of it and that um uh it's hard to work through you know all that conditioning in a in an open and, and vulnerable way when yeah i think people are so ready to come down on you if you don't have the right thoughts or right thinking about yep. things and and that's really hard um, yeah absolutely i don't think we can yeah i mean i think we just have to try to keep creating uh environments where people feel safe enough to actually have honest conversations right yeah. and uh you know i think that take, obviously that's what you all do on a daily basis with people one-on-one -on -one or in groups and um you know i think at the outing club when we're out on trips you know it's a lot yeah, that's another uh, environment in which you have the opportunity to have some real conversations with people and you know if you spend a day canoeing down a river with one person you run out of the sort of simple introductory yeah. stuff sure. and you can actually delve in a little deeper and it's you know it's really those are that's what i love about my job right is i bet I getting bet. To have those interactions with people on a regular basis so yeah. maybe speaking of getting into the deeper things um i was wondering if you just wanted to highlight any other issues that are worth just naming like um these sort of elephants in the room that um, we know are are going on, but but just aren't being talked about in the open and, and really need sure. to. I mean, I think we've touched on a lot of it, right? I think that for our students, especially, I think, and, you know, just reflecting back on my personal experience as a student here at Bowdoin, but also, you know, just as an 18 to 20, whatever year old, um, you know, really 18 to 55 year old now, because it just <laughs> keeps going, right, <laughs> as we know. But I think that uh, all of the issues, you know, masculinity for guys, right? No matter, you know, whether you're a varsity athlete uh, or, you, be talking or about. Yeah. you know, it, it just, there's so much there, right? That we, I, I don't feel like I've even gotten close to delving into that for myself, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, at that age, you know, all the way through school, it's the sexuality and gender piece The, you know, the sexuality piece is so confusing and so challenging for so many kids. And, you know, we do sex education and I think, you know, that's great, but the, the personal sort of uh, struggle with figuring that out and relationships that you have or don't have and, um, you know, yeah. situations that you encounter and, you know, how you navigate those. And then there's almost no opportunity, almost there is no opportunity to we actually unpack any of that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and process it. Yeah. So you were just all left out there on an island. I mean, if you're really lucky, you have a good friend, you can kind of say, wow, I had this crazy experience or this really weird conversation or whatever, right? Or worse, right? Obviously a lot of people have really negative uh, experiences. But yeah. we don't have there. We don't have a mechanism to deal with that stuff, right? Unless you are already in counseling, right? Uh, or seek it out, right? Seek that help out, which we talked about. Even already. that's just that's just one person. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that piece obviously is huge. And then now I think um, I think racism is uh, a struggle for all of us because regardless of who you are, right? White, black, doesn't matter right? You have had this life experience and now you're um, being challenged, right? In whatever way. And um, 
you're trying to navigate that, right? Because we just talked about the cancel culture, right? A lot, for a lot of people, it's like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And I would imagine that it's really challenging regardless of your perspective or what side of any of these issues you're on, right? How, how do you navigate this? Because it's really complex and it's really complicated. And I think we have so many different views of what the perfect world would look like and we're never gonna get there, but even to try to address, you know, the very flawed world that we're existing in is a real challenge. So, yeah. It kind of is it fair to say though, Michael, as you're bringing up these things like racism and sexism relationships like it is complicated and i feel like we're pointing to some pretty simple things too mm -hmm. about them like yep absolutely not all complicated actually no no <laughs> it, it's actually pretty simple but it requires having conversations with people having you know it's really all about relationships, right? You guys must talk about that all the time, right? All Everything that we do it involves a relationship with someone else in our lives, right? And uh, unfortunately, usually the most important relationships are the most challenging mm -hmm. relationships, right? right? And how we navigate those. And uh, because that's, you know, uh, whether it's my parents or my spouse or my children, right? Those are critical and yet those are constantly i'm constantly screwing up something with those right yeah. and then you know i think about with colleagues at work right and friends and um you know it, it the further the less important it is the easier it is to do okay i, I feel like yeah. if you're trying if you're trying to to do well right um but it is it's working on relationships and having honest conversations and trying to you know it's that it's the goal of trying to do your best and it's real that's really challenging and a big that ties right back into our mental health right if i get out of bed in the morning and i'm really not feeling like i'm on my best i'm not gonna, that that's not going to be a great day yeah. right yeah. mentally so i i appreciate what you're expressing particularly michael because like this was your journey i feel like from what you you're talking about like sure. going from a place of less awareness around particular relationships in your life. And you now strike, I mean, I'm sure it's gone on for a while now, but you definitely strike me as someone who, where relationships are like, they're like the cornerstone of your life. Like they, they feel very important to you. And sure, but that's true for all of us, right? <laughs> I think, <laughs> I mean, how, how much we center that though. I think yeah. Well, whether we're aware of it or not. Yeah, right. And I, I don't want to make, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I'm actually really good at relationships. That's <laughs> not true at all. I'm just trying to be, get better at it is what I would say. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's where we're all at. Yeah. Hey, I think that goes a long way. I, I, yeah. You do strike me as someone who's very intentional about yeah. that. Yeah. The impact we have, like the, the actual, um, yeah results and for all of us it's it's up in the air um last question for now um any um any kind of words you want to leave us with um things you feel like uh students might need to hear at a time like this um mm -hmm. any kind of perspective you have from your experience um around what we're dealing with um, the times we're living in right now. Yep. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, what we've been talking about, being willing to uh, sort of think about, about your own mental health and wellness as well as physical health and wellness and being um, open to others, right? Whether that's in close relationships, right? We're all, we're all struggling with a lot, I think, Pretty much always, but during this pandemic and uh, you know the social uh, unrest that we're having, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and there's uh, the political uh, culture that we've been in deeply um, for so long now. There's just a lot of stress on all of us. I, I've realized that I have felt an incredible amount of stress that just is there, not related to any particular. Um, event right in my life uh, but yeah. just it's right. sitting there it's almost like that black cloud that hangs over uh, one of those peanuts characters right and just yeah. follows them around exactly. and uh, I think that's just real for almost everyone and so 
just recognizing that, being aware of that and being willing to, uh, you know, reach out to people and, you know, work on relationships, right? And, and uh, you know, be honest with people and try to develop, you know, really constructive and positive relationships. I think that's what helps you. I know when I'm having a bad day, if I can talk to, you know, one of my friends, my close friends who are very few and far between, unfortunately, um, or, you know, or my wife and, or my kids, you know, if I get to spend a day um, with one of my kids, Finnegan and I on Tuesday were kayaking because it had just rained and some of the rivers were up and yeah. Oh, unbelievable, positive mental health day to spend the day um, with my, with my 20, almost 22 year old son, you know, paddling whitewater together, just mm -hmm. do it, you know, cause it's such a cooperative partnership sort of activity and, and then, you know, driving, driving around in a, in a vehicle for another six hours or so and just talking about life you know that those huge huge positives so you know really investing in those kind of opportunities is the key i think you know not helpful to sort of uh sequester ourselves uh even when we're forced to right obviously we are doing a lot of quarantining and staying at home but even virtually reaching out to folks and um maintaining those uh communications and not just posting stuff on social media, I think, but actually, you know, I've sat down and written a lot of letters by hand, you know, with a mm -hmm. pen on a piece of paper. I've heard of that. And then, of thing. Yeah. yeah, it's old technology, but it's amazing. Old and, you know, sticking an envelope, addressing it, putting a stamp on it and taking it to the post office. Um, I think getting a letter, right, is amazing. But the process of writing a letter, also incredibly, you know, just powerful, reflective opportunity to think about what it is that you're that. putting down on paper. I'm going to take you up on that. I yeah. Thank and you. then, cause then you, it's like, you know, it's one of those gifts that keep on giving. You got to do, write this letter. So you got to really communicate stuff that you felt was important. And yeah. then you got to mail it to somebody else and then they get it. So it's really a huge impact for them yeah. too. So yeah, there you go. Thank you for the room. That is tip yeah. for the day. Snail mail. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to, I have to give Tess Hamilton credit. She taught us how to make really cool envelopes from magazine uh, photos. And that actually yeah. helps too, because you get to have a little creative process of making the envelope as well. So all of these things we desperately need right now. And I'm, yeah. I can yep. them to students, the, the like tangible in the moment, like your mind focused on something yep. very concrete, very simple. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And uh, that's, we didn't actually get into this much, but one of my biggest mental health, uh, uh, my absolute, the big, the most important, and part I mentioned going paddling with Finnegan the other day, but really going outside and um, walking in the woods yeah. or, you know, in the commons. I mean, here at Bowdoin, we have access to some great stuff, whether it's over, you know, at Brunswick Landing or out in the commons or, you know, just going to the beach, whatever it is, you know, we're really lucky here because we have access to so much outside terrain. And, uh, you know, it's a meditative process to get to just walk outside. And I spend a lot of time just sitting in the woods and listening to the birds and getting scolded by little red squirrels. And, um, you know, that's incredibly therapeutic and um, yeah. rest restful for the mind. So, yeah. Michael, I appreciate everything you're saying, really. Um, it's, it exemplifies why I wanted to do this. And, 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 and really, specifically, that to what you're saying, you know, being open to others, because like everybody's dealing with something, everyone is going through something. Um, I'm not being particularly strategic in choosing people to do this. Like, I feel like I could talk to anybody, and everyone has something that they know and they, they have to share, and, and you know. And understand about the world and um yeah so thank you um oh, my pleasure it's always a pleasure talking to you I feel yeah like you've got so much to say so much to offer so <laughs> i was gonna say we could talk for another hour but you probably have an appointment you need to get to yeah I do. I do. no it's uh it's great <laughs> it's great talking to you roland and thanks for inviting me and uh we'll do it again sometime <laughs>